Let me start out with uh, an anecdote. Uh, in the ninth, late 1930s, <coughs> two physicists visited uh, Albert Einstein, and uh, they uh, brought with them the concern that Nazi scientists had made enormous strides in the development of a prospective nuclear device. Uh, in their view, this project was a success. It would be a game changer, and the Nazis really kept the uh, Einstein listened to this very carefully, considered the issues before him, which were obviously value issues. Uh, here we have a weapon of immense destruction. Uh, should he support it at all? Uh, at least in the terms of the United States being involved in it. Uh, should he do it upon what reasons was the advancement of science or the advancement of a national security interest of the United States? Those are choices that he clearly had to make. Uh, in any event, he decided that it would be more appropriate as a value choice to communicate to the President of the United States and have the United States uh, get into this business and try to preempt the Nazis on this question. Hence was launched through Roosevelt, the Manhattan Project. So Einstein could have to make some choices about this. And I suspect that without his imprimatur, the United States would not have gone forward with this project. Now, the second choice comes. Uh, the man chosen to lead the project was Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was a leading physicist from Berkeley University and a master organizer. Uh, we don't know precisely why Einstein, uh, why Oppenheimer agreed to do it. Was it because of the advancement of science or because of the national security interest? Different values, but nonetheless he did it, but were ambiguous as to the reason to do it. <clears throat> when the bomb was detonated over Japan, Oppenheimer wasn't consulted on it, neither were the other scientists. The matter had shifted from the scientific establishment to the national security establishment. And Einstein was overseen, I'm sorry, uh, Oppenheimer was overseen by General Leslie Gross, who represented the security of the United States. Uh, Oppenheimer was quite shocked at the extent of the destructiveness of the weapon. And uh, we can only speculate as to what he said privately, but I suspect that he would have thought there may have been other ways to demonstrate this destructive capacity without actually having to exterminate hundreds of thousands of human beings. In any event, he opposed the creation of an even more lethal weapon, the hydrogen bomb. And in this, he was confronted by Edward Teller. Teller approaches science from a vigorously anti communist perspective. In other words, he had barriers and he saw communism as a big threat. And he wanted a bigger weapon to contain it. Uh, in the context of this conflict between the two scientists, it was Teller who was the more effective politician because Oppenheimer had his security clearance was drawn from the United States. That's the equivalent of saying that Oppenheimer was a security threat. Uh, <clears throat> Terra succeeded, and the United States launched itself into the testing of the hydrogen bomb, several of them, in the South Pacific, uh, which created a massive consequence in the sense that the Soviet Union decided to test its weapons as well, and we had the, the nuclear arms race, and we were still in the partial close of that. And so the question then becomes, uh, uh, what is hydrogen? What does Einstein think of this? What does Oppenheimer think of this? What do these represent for scientific responsibility and ultimately for values? Oppenheimer met with Einstein, and Einstein uttered those famous words which said, Science should be a blessing and not a curse to you. Clearly, a notion that scientific responsibility required science to be constructive and not. And that there was some social responsibility, at least for scientists, for that consequence. 
their discussions, I think, relate to the creation of the World Academy of Art and Science. And the World Academy put into its creator right from the beginning the principle that the Academy would be concerned with all forms of knowledge generated in terms of the social consequences and policy implications. Now that's fairly neutral, you know. They maybe you could have said, well, the Academy should be for human rights and peace. It quite say that. <coughs> so the language, although you can imply this, is not very clear. I'm not quite sure why this was, but I suspect that scientists at the time, as they still are today, are somewhat concerned about the value implications of what they do. Human rights, peace, relative security, it would be in a far more direction. Whereas the relatively neutral terms with the implications of that, social consequences, policy implications, uh, are easier to, for the scientific establishment to digest. Now this uh, leads me into the next phase, the academy incubated for many years, but it emerged with an interesting and, uh, if you like, eclectic agenda. It's got interest in security, interest in economic things, and technology, uh, interest in the environment, and a whole range of what I would call important progressive global issues. And the Academy is distinctive in the sense that its concerns from the very beginning were always global and not national, uh, constrained by national uh, sentiments and solidarities. Um, the, the, this pushes us into the next phase, I think, which is uh, the new item on the agenda, where we have my job on the very form of the UN. Where does the Academy stand on? Where does it stand? on the saving and universalization of fundamental human rights, of eco-social responsibility for the integrity of the planet, and more. So you can see that this, from where we are as an institution, we are on the cusp of immense value challenges as an institution. And then the question is, and what exactly does this mean for our role in providing some sense of normative guidance for the integrity of higher education in our time and in the immediate future. And that's where the question of values come from. Now, the, in a narrow sense, about 12 or 13 of the fellows of the academy are having the finally the discourse of this intellectual on the question of values. Uh, most importantly, they finally this discussion in the context of the legal profession and pose the question, at least as far back as 1945, and that is, uh, what is legal education for? What is legal education in the university for? And they took the position that legal education and training in lawyers had to be in the public interest. And to know what the public interest is, is in part a political question. We need to be able to delineate all the things that lawyers do, then figure out with what intensity they impact or do not impact as they should on the question. But it still begs the question, how do we define the question? And uh, our former president, Glasgow, and his colleagues toyed with the idea that, well, you know, the public interest has primarily something to do with the concept of human dignity. But then the question is, what do you get this human being to concept of? How do you validate and how do you sell it to the international community? And so let's think the better part of their lives extrapolating on that question. I'll come back to that in a moment because there's very rich literature on this which I'll try to introduce you to in terms. Um, but uh, the, 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 the roots of this way of thinking were in part influenced by the famous uh, Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal. And Gunnar Myrdal finally the form of social science research that was quite irritating in its own time and still remains a, a paradigm of the way it's supposed to be done. He wrote a book in the 1940s called 
the American dilemma. And what he wanted to look at was race relations in the world. But how do you look at it without evaluating the end something? And where do you get the idea of a standard to evaluate it from? Well, what he did was he looked at the American experience in politics and its constitutional development, and he found that ubiquitous in this condition was the principle of equality. So then he could use the principle of equality as postulated principle to guide all his research. Now the research had a very potent effect because you could measure equality in terms of actual performance. So, but, but the central point that I made of it was that you have to have values to guide research. And here you could find the value there that it would be because the Declaration of Bill of Rights, look at the Declaration of Independence, you could expect this at least rhetorically, they, they're just not living up to it. Uh, so, Lassell took that and tried to develop that further. But uh, I have to go back and, and face the other elements of it. It's not only the values, it's detailing the values, understanding that they operate at multiple levels and they interact with each other. So, one value affects another value. It's really very simple as that. Assuming you think that generating wealth is important. What do you do with wealth? Well, I want an active political office, so I support politics. So wealth influences power. Well, if I need some brains to run a political office, I get an education. Uh, if I need to mobilize compassion, I value affection. So values interplay with each other as they're sold for their own sake, they also influence every other value, making the lives more complex. But in aggregate, what national tried to show is when these work together, they help to advance the principle of human dignity, and that's where we need to go. Now, just in a nutshell, uh, the, the, one of the important reasons for values in our education <coughs> is that Dewey and Lazarus and others had assumed, or at least developed, an idea that, that uh, education in general, and high education in particular, is concerned with the, with the transmittal of thinking skills. Literally, they tell us how we think. Now, when we're younger, it's more rudimentary, but when you get to the university level, it's much more sophisticated. The tools of thinking become much more critical for the development of the human capacity for thought, uh, the human capacity for character development, and so on. And so one of the important things that I do is to clarify it to you and give us these five intellectual thoughts. And, and I summarized them in the paper, so I won't go through them all, but we call these intellectual skills that, that uh, operate across the board in higher education. Uh, uh, the first of these was the, the relevance of values. Now, as a practical matter, why are values relevant? Because almost any problem of significance is a conflict about values. When you look at the problem, at the back of the problem, one person wants this, another person wants that, the state wants this, the interest group wants that, and so on. And so the first problem that you have to deal with is you've got to deal with values, you've got to find out what they are, you've got to describe them, you've got to bring them to bear for relevance in terms of what the problem is. If you don't understand the value of conflict, how do you know what the problem is? If you don't know what the problem is, what are you trying to solve? You see? And other thinking skills that connect up with this would be the understanding of the thing. How do these value conflicts have been handled? scientific condition, what are the causes and consequences of particular distribution and generation of values. And then the projection of future developments and ultimately creative thinking. How do we just go about trying to create a result? So these are quite there and they cut across whatever the screen you want to take. Now I just mentioned that, I'm not going to go through them, but we can discuss them later. Uh, what I'd like to now discuss is this. From this point of view, the, the central point that we're looking at is ultimately that the consumers of higher education 
the stakeholder in them, by individual students, all their parts of the field, and in a broader sense, the faculty <coughs> themselves in the learning process. So we deal with human subjectivity, pervading all of our institutions by education. And of course, modern uh, science really does its best to preclude the consideration of human subjectivity from our we said, well, yes, science is objective, but we never ask the question, why did the guy choose this in the first place? Why did he go in this particular direction? And we tend to preclude this from the universe of this course. And the reason is fairly obvious. Uh, uh, science thrives in objectivity, not human subjectivity. And rather than analyzing and carefully delineating human subjectivity, we prefer to avoid it. And by avoiding it, we also avoid responsibility for what people do or do not do. So, uh, I won't go into detail with that other than there are lots of different... My papers summarize the, the measurement of human subjectivity. Uh, I might just send a very from economist has focused on human subjectivity as a foundation, although it's a bit confused as to you actually measure it. Yeah, I want human subjectivity, but sometimes people are stupid and then I have to avoid human subjectivity. Whatever way they do it, they don't. So that's it. Uh, but I've got a full discussion that I want to put out here. So, so the, 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 the then question, of course, is even if you think in values, you have to think about not only higher levels of sanction like human beings, but you also have to look at the value components of human science. If you try to find. So in the paper, I, I focus on the, the, the notion of the uh, fact that enlightenment is, of course, one of the objectives of higher education. And then the question, of course, even if we look at um, enlightenment as an objective, we have to contextualize it to find out how it actually functions in society. So the enlightenment is not only sort of concept, but it serves as a base of power with some other values in society. And therefore the university is not closed out to the larger social process of the um, part. And then I went further, but to, I'm mean, stopping this reverse the, the First of all, how do we get these values? We've got human dignity, but what are the components of it? And that is itself an interesting question. The, the roots of it lie with Malinowski, who determined uh, in studies in the South Pacific that human, uh, that, that human beings have needs. And the needs are frequently expressed in institutions that they generate that are specialized in the realization of those needs. So what he did was he used values and he used the needs and he identified institutions in a rather rudimentary way. Radcliffe Brown, who was a rich anthropologist, took that needs institutional analysis and developed an institutional framework for needs as well. But he still didn't have the very complete taxonomy of what the specific values were. Last will work on this and came up with three or four, but after 1948, with the development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, he could use that to determine that there were eight, I think, actually nine values that, uh, that if in the aggregate, uh, would constitute more or less the foundation of moving towards human dignity if the values are shaped and shared optimally. Uh, and these values are first power, uh, and that's what's preference for power, is the shared power, the shaping and sharing of power. Wealth, the shaping and sharing of wealth. Uh, skill, the shaping and sharing of skill, the shaping and sharing of respect, well-being, wealth, skill, intimacy, uh, rectitude, and I added in mind that respect. So we have nine identifiable values which are largely influenced by anthropological literature and literature from uh, uh, the, the human rights community. Um, the needs approach 
still survived in the form of Maslow's work, uh, the psychologist, comes into the roughly, a roughly similar dichotomy of, of, of the value. So the critical question is A, to describe the value, and two, to ask yourself and what the preference is. You have to make a preference. Uh, do you prefer optimally shaping and sharing power, optimally shaping and sharing power? Or do you only want optimally produce and not shape? And but the optimal shaping and sharing would, would in the aggregate hopefully produce a public order that better approximate the idea of the order. Now, so that we have this, and I just need to add one or two things. Uh, so the value scheme that we created here it was not out of the blue, it came from scientific literature and it came from the development of an international program. You think to get this, but we have a UN Charter. We have a UN Charter with its purposes, and, and it articulates as a constitutional principle the values. So it isn't out of the blue, it is an enormous uh, uh, consensus on, on what the values are, although a reluctance sometimes to adopt them. So we have scientific organizations, Hemming and Hoyne, when they ask, well, is your organization for or against you? Mm -hmm. no, not sure. So, so that's uh, where we are on that score and, and the, the content of this thing. Now, just a, a, a few other thoughts uh, by way of conclusion here. Uh, uh, the the uh, question of the values of uh, higher education and, 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 and University is still very uneasy about the notion that the purpose of the university should be to promote and defend a universal bill of rights. It's not, it shouldn't be controversial, but it is. It's still, I think, because of the tradition of positivism, which says the university has to be neutral. Uh, and scientists themselves are always uneasy about the notion that what I'm doing may be testable by some some high standard. But nevertheless, there is a challenge that we have to consider carefully. This issue came up in the context of Croatia, where the Croatians raised the question then explicitly, what is the intellectual responsibility for peace and security? Very clear, very explicit, and an important issue. Um, and it's my great pleasure to have worked with several Croatian intellectuals who took these seriously, right, to those classes. So, and I learned that from them, respect. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, just to, to briefly summarize the, the context uh, intellectually, we have had some important literature. Uh, the philosopher of the came up with a theory of justice, which is a minimal theory. What he did was imagine as a blind thing over here. And you know that over on the other side of the blind thing, some people are getting screwed. So, would you choose something that permits you to survive being screwed or not? If you choose survival, you've got a theory of justice, you see. And it's an absolutely minimum theory. Uh, uh, but same type to provide a critique of rules by struggling to suggest that maybe we should deal with the international world, right? But he has an economist imperfect understanding of the world. And his concept of, uh, of uh, individual uh, uh, responsibility is quite problematic. They want to look at what subjectivity is. But they have no way of measuring it and no way of dealing with irrational problems. So he's okay, but, but I, I'm not. The, the, the most compelling uh, 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 modern uh, theory has come from Dworkin, and Dworkin has raised the question, which all of us can understand Does the individual human being have an ethical responsibility to make his or her life? a successful experience or a waste of opportunities. And if you confront that question, you say, no, I want it to be a successful experience, 
that you cannot deny the simple principles of every non sad life. Mm -hmm. Once you convert the ethical principles into a moral principle, which is summarized as your conversion of the moral. That is more or less where we are in the conventional system. Now, getting back to Lazarus and the Biblical basis, two fact view on this. The first view was to follow murder and persecution. Look, to postulate human dignity as a principle of divine teaching and divine requirement. To postulate <coughs> and make it explicit so that if people don't like it, they can criticize it. But it's out there and it's up front. Now, that's the view that they basically took. They took another view, I think, because it came out of the discussion I had in my and I said, but what we first in your view is you have human dignity and self evident. So it would appear to me that every non self other would be saying, well, I also want human dignity for myself. So they come close to both ethical and moral principles. Uh, he agreed with me, but he didn't really write it up so much. But they come close to open any event, I think these two things will add to that somewhat clearly on. Same. Gets us pretty close to it, theoretically uh, justifiable view that, that values and human beings are not only inherent in higher education, they should be something. And finally, I was last going to give us last and therapeutics. And so, what is it for? Well, if you're dealing with the education of human beings, both faculty and students, you're dealing with human capital, or as Alberto Zaccone said, human potentiality. And if that's the case, what more serious commitment can there be, ethically and morally, to the principle that we enhance and secure as effectively as possible the human capital, the human potentiality of every human being qualified to Thank you. I wanted to, to make a few comments. Uh, the first one is said uh, we should go back to the values to solve and understand conflict. And I, I tend to agree, and then I said, yeah, but, but maybe we can have the same value and for the sake of the same value behave completely differently. And I said, for example, justice. Imagine a country where a government is completely corrupted illegal, illegitimate by any form, and you represent some people who say this government is illegitimate, is using force uh, at the expense of the good of others. This situation is very, very, very classical. Uh, colonialism uh, used to be such a um, legitimate uh, power, and we, we may have this issue of how to behave at, at the, with the name of justice in such a position. And I remember two, people, two kind of um, thought process. One, which is justice can be taken by force if the government is illegitimate. The other thought process is nothing justifies suffering. In one way you've got Che Guevara, and the other way you've got Gandhi. Same situation, same value of justice, completely different uh, way to, to express and to live the values. So that was one of my comments. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is, um, uh, Nietzsche was saying man is something to be overcome. And, and I would say adulthood is something that has to be overcome. Adult, the, being, the fact to be an adult. It's, it sounds obvious that, a kid, that kids evolve, that teenagers evolve. But why being an adult would it be synonymous of being at the final stage of our evolution? Is it because we can reproduce or because we can use strength? What makes us legitimate in the use of our ability to reproduce or to use force. And I believe absolutely nothing. The only thing that can guarantee is for me to become 
a, a, a man in the sense of Carl Gustav Jung's individuation, we are not prepared to overcome our fears, to overcome our sins, our negative qualities, our shadow personality. And as long as we do not face this shadow personality, we are not legitimate in this status of being an adult. And I wanted to, to, to keep on with, with this subject of individual responsibility vis-à-vis -vis oneself to become a man. And I wanted to, I always remember that morality that is forced by belief system or governments was something that in the, in the years of 1940s in France and in Germany, by the fact that sending a Jew to jail or to a death camp was something that is both legal and legitimate, it was moral. I believe it was unethical. So morality is for me something that comes from a government, from an outside regulator. Whereas ethics come from this sense of internal individuation process, relying on whatever you want to call it, rule of karma, uh, the soul, and somebody is going to wait your soul at the end of your life to say if you've been a good person, call it God, call it St. Peter's, whatever. But there got to be someone who is responsible for your acts. And this individuation process is for me the only warrant, guarantee, ethics, and that we overcome um, the fact that we are adults but not finished. Thank you very much. Um, first, I think education sells. You know, uh, we consider that all educational programs should meet the requirements of the economy. And you can measure that by the return of investment. If you study humanities, the return is much lower after five or ten years than if you studied MIST, okay, mathematics, engineering, science, or technology. Uh, historically, the purpose of education and the value of education is different. If you look at biographies of Rabelais, for example, of, or of Humboldt, two Renaissance men, they considered a much broader and holistic form of values, of values of education, you know? Because they were interested in knowledge, in wisdom, in understanding nature, in understanding society and human being. If you take that, that education sells first, and then look at the fact that if we had to educate another 80% of the world population, we needed a GDP which is four times the size it's now. And if you consider in order to do that, to increase our GDP by a factor four, this way of growing this way of growth, which is basically a technological growth of education or an educational growth of technology, will meet the limits of our planet. So we are in a dilemma. First, we've got to grow. First, we've got to educate people. And second, we produce technology, which is sooner or later replacing substantial parts of those who are educated. Figures show that up to 30 to 40 percent of those who have higher education degrees will be replaced in the next 25 years by automation, by robots. So we end up with a very complicated dilemma. You know, we have an education system that feeds into an economic growth which produces growth patterns which are not sustainable and technology that reduces human labor at the end. And it produces an educational system which has a half time of basically five years. So if you start your program and end up in five years, 50% of your knowledge is already outdated in general, at least in life science. Um, so two questions. What's about training programs 
which are for four to 12 months only, but lifelong, you go back and forth. You go back to university for four months, high intensity training, then you go back to life. And after five, to eight to 10 years to do the same thing again. And second, this is what my uh, president uh, uh, speaker said, shouldn't education has a different goal? Shouldn't we prepare the next generation to solve complex problems, you know? Psychologists call this indeed individuation, you know, living a purposeful life and becoming yourself. This has nothing to do with return of investment or economic growth. Let me just share with you this story, and that's this organization. Again, which is uh, very, um, which is related to or institutional partner with uh, World University Consortium, which is IAUP, International Association of University Presidents. Um, and this organization was the organization created by the founder of our University, uh, uh, Dr. Cho of Chang University, and. And, 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 and in conjunction with putting values in education, this IAUP, the organization which was created in the year of 1965, has the same spirit of putting values in higher education. That's the reason why they gathered together and, and, and created this organization. And one of the symbolic efforts done by this organization was establishing a called so called UN International Day of Peace, which happens to be today. Happy Peace Day. So anyway, uh, that's one example of how and how and why this uh, particular day was created by this organization. And this is a symbolic day, but uh, by having this, uh, we celebrate this day and, and think about uh, the meaning of peace and how the higher education institution can play a role in building peace. And by the way, this every year, every year our university is celebrating this day by having some special events. And particular, particularly this today, uh, it was the, the, the day, and and, 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 and and on our campus, very special event of today's uh, and this year's program was doctorate degree awarded to Vatslav Pavel, the late uh, president Vatslav Pavel, Czech Republic. Well, in my humble interpretation, value-based, value-based politics actually practice. It's just like fairy tales to like that. So my question is this: uh, I, I think this, this value-based education is very related to the discussion of hot, you know, the global consciousness, the evolution of consciousness, and so on. And so forth. And this is very relevant hot areas and very important. And if it's possible, I would like to listen to the story again about what's or academy. And this eminent organization started with this very spirit of, of, of three values in education following Einstein. After all these years, how do you see? Yeah, could you please share, if, if it's possible, could you please share with us some, some, some examples of three values in Education and so on, and, and how do you see all these with this, with this uh, you know, the, the paradox? Thank you. Values are fascinating because you take any any story, any event when there has been progress in society, or any success story at, in any field, at any level, at the level of uh, a country or society at the level of an organization or at the level of an individual, you study any success, there are values at the basis of this success. Anything, like if you take uh, at the level of country, for instance, this legendary integrity of the, the British gentleman who, would, who could not tell a lie and who would always keep his word, this laid the foundation for um, 
development of Britain as, as a commercial empire long before there were international laws that could enforce legal contracts. This way, each country has a value on which its, its progress and development has been based. And if we take organizations, for instance, there are these organizations which are, are known for some positive value of theirs, which has led to its uh, rising to the top in the field, like um, FedEx for its you know, punctuality, its reliability, uh, BMW for quality, or Google for its accuracy. If Google, uh, when we need anything, Google has become a verb now. And, and or Apple for its innovation or creativity. So it's some positive value that an organization follows, adheres to, that has led to its uh, rising to the top. And if we take uh, the, the individuals at the level of the individual, we again have its, uh, some very, very uh, strong values that, that uh, make people right, that make them leaders. Like if we take, for instance, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King Jr. or Nelson Mandela, these people, they believed in the sacredness of human life and in freedom and equality for everybody. And this, this value that they very, very uh, strongly believed in, it gave them this, you know, this aspiration and the energy to fulfill their aspiration. If you take uh, Gandhi, for instance, there were uh, times when there were Hindu-Muslim riots in the country and there were places where the army was called in. Where the rioting was very intense, Gandhi went there and he said, uh, I am going on a fast till you people stop the fighting. I will fast unto death if you don't stop. And the people have stopped uh, the, the rioting. And that was the strength of his personality. And this strength came from his value. He valued the human life so much and that added value to him. So at any level in the individual, in the organization, in the society, it is values that result in success, in progress. And uh, so when values are this important, are we including them in, in our education? How are we including them? We are producing a lot of engineers and, and postgraduates and doctors. There is a lot of technical information that we equip all our students with. But what about values? Because we see that it is on the basis of values that, that uh, uh, people accomplish. Uh, in 2006, Nature published an article which said that in the previous three years, one third of the scientists had admitted to polishing or fudging or cherry picking data to suit their, their purposes. And in uh, 2012, again, the same journal, it said that the leading research papers on, on, on cancer, it could not be replicated, even using the same scientists. So what does this show about the, the quality of uh, values that we are including in our education? And uh, I would just like to conclude with, with this question or with this point that, you know, we need to look at. Um, in fact, this is something that I learned from Alberto uh, maybe a year back. The American Psychological Association, it works in collaboration with the U.S. government uh, using its uh, advanced knowledge of uh, human psychology. They devise these, these methods to take down the personality of, of uh, prisoners and get uh, data, information from them, from the unwilling prisoners. Uh, basically, uh, devices of you know, mental torture. But then the American Psychiatric Association, it said, no, we will have nothing to do with this kind of work. So we are producing associations and people with this value, and we are also creating at the same time, our education is also creating people with, with, with the opposite set of ideas that they believe in. And so I would uh, like to hear from Winston and from everybody here. How are we teaching these values? They definitely are so essential to our, to our success, to our progress, any accomplishment. And so, this is very essential to integrate values of education. And in our future education, it has to be a very important.